everybody. This is Heather Locke with Lasting Conversations, and I have Valerie Staggs with us today. Hey, Valerie. Hi. Happy Hi. Saturday, everyone. <laughs> it's really great to, to have you with us. We are Zooming in today. I'm in a, a, a studio location where people are busy doing their thing and working diligently, and Valerie has an amazing background. For those of you who can't see it, um, yet it's of a huge construction site and so valerie's main business right now is she is the founder of an organization called take on trades and this has to do with connecting people for the trade industry to companies and employers that desperately need the help so but this seems like a really really important conversation to be having these days so welcome again and tell us about yourself and what you are doing with take on trades well thank you and i'm just really happy to be here i've been listening to this podcast for a while and um, find your conversations amazing and the people uh, you know so interesting so i'm thank glad to be you. one of them thanks so much um, so take on trades i've been working on for a number of years uh, I my background is in marketing and advertising, and so for 21 years I ran a marketing firm, and um, I came across this issue several years ago because a lot of my clients were trade based types of companies, um, and I was helping them with their marketing. And what they were telling me was, I would love to spend more money in marketing and get more customers, but I have no employees. I can't find people to actually fulfill the work. Right. So I looked at this as a challenge kind of for me um, and selfishly, like if I could get them more workers, they would spend more money in marketing and I would make more money. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, there's the synergy of it right? all, the synergy of it all. Yes, exactly. So that's kind of where it, it emanated from. Well, you know, and there has been this call from an maybe we can get into if you happen to know why or what it is and i know it definitely has a lot more to do with well people were getting subsidies there seems to be a seismic shift on how people work how people want to work what even the employers that there's just been so many changes you know the ibms of the world that you would be grandfathered in and taken care of you work for them for 30 years they will take care of you the rest of your life those things don't happen anymore. Yeah. So everything has changed. Um, the one thing that has not changed, and I know here in Florida and other places, what it really comes up, that we forget that when the proverbial shit hits the fan and there's a storm or something, you want people with chainsaws and you want trucks and you want hard hats and you want boots and you want leathered hands and the wisdom and, uh, wisdom and knowledge of electricians and plumbers and ditch diggers and the hard manual work. So tell us more again, and, and you're, I'm looking at a construction zone. We need people to safely build the buildings. Anybody can slap up a building, sure. but we need to have um, the knowledge and wherewithal to safely put up those buildings and have the huge team of people to do that. So how are you find? Oh, I will add one more thing. And it didn't come across on my road trip that I was having. People in the restaurant fields, you know, people everywhere, the restaurants and, and businesses truly are feeling um, the lack of folks showing up. And, you know, then there are signs on some doors saying, listen, please, if you're having a bad day, please don't take it out on the people who have shown up today. Just come in for your coffee. Let's <laughs> smile and engage with each other. If you're having a bad way, don't yell at the folks who have shown up. <laughs> exactly. So how how is this working for you and and how are you making these connections to yeah. have people know that joining a trade and having training in this is actually a fantastic career? Yeah, so the what has happened with trade industries and the whole conversation about careers in in the trades mm -hmm. uh, it, it's kind of a three-pronged issue. Um, so the first piece of that has to do with um, what has happened in the educational system. Right. And that goes back to like the 1980s when the, uh, you know, funding for education changed um, because the initiative, um, as well-meaning as it was, uh, was to fund um, academic 
in schools that related to math, science, science and English. Right. Um, and the intention was to raise up, you know, people within the school systems that maybe are were of a lower income or um, had not had opportunities in the academic um, world that might bring them to college and higher paying careers. Um, and then subsequently in the early 2000s, we had No Child Left Behind, which further funded those programs. Um, uh, but the downside of that was that that translated into loss of programs in uh, career and technical education in schools. Um, so my brother, my older brother is 57. He's a auto mechanic. He always wanted to be an auto mechanic. He learned to be an auto mechanic in high school because we used to have those programs. I was just going to say there used to be vocational yes. programs. And in some ways there are, there are some magnet schools, but in general, the wide swath of budgetary cuts were in education Correct. Cut yes. out home ec and wood shop and all those vocational types of things. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, we're seeing a little bit of a return to, oh dear, um, we, we kind of upset the apple cart. And so you are seeing career and technical education coming back in schools, but it's, you know, it's like moving the tans Titanic. It, it doesn't. Move <laughs> um, so that's, that's issue number one. The second issue is what's going on in the trade businesses, mm -hmm. which is um, kind of twofold. First, there's a lot more funding in terms of infrastructure. We hear this conversation going on in Washington. We hear it in the state of Florida is, you know, we need to re um, uh, to work on our infrastructure roads and um, bridges and the things in our country that need to be addressed that all require trade labor and trade workers. Um, and so there's a lot more money there, a lot more projects, um, and that puts a lot more demand on trade industries who are having problems finding workers. And then the second part of what's going on in the trades is that the people who have been a plumber, let's say, or an electrician for many years um, are getting older and they're retiring. So about half of trade workers are 50 and older right now. Um, and, you know, they're, they want to enjoy their RVs and <laughs> their vacation homes and, and take retirement. So we have the issue of uh, young people not going into trade industries. And then, of course, the people who are aging out. So uh, that's the second part of the triangle. Um, and the third part of the triangle is the mentality of young people these days, uh, which we hear about quite a bit in terms of millennials and Gen Z and, and their um, particular mentality. Um, and so the third part of the conversation is how do you talk to young people about the careers in the trades and um, and how do we strike that conversation that's interesting to them and, and spoken in their own language and really appeals to them? Because right now between the millennials and Generation Z, that's about 75% of our workforce. Uh, so we need to start engaging with them and talking to them about careers in the trades. Going back to the guys that are retiring, and I know that they have so much wisdom and I've heard some of these guys, whether they're architects or in the other fields, literally kind of worried when they look over the shoulder and they see who's coming up and sure. maybe some of the standards have shifted or whatever it is that they are just saying, uh oh, how is this really going to happen? You know, and and are you how is the baton getting uh, handed over? How are you finding that happening? Yeah, so. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I, I should say, the people who own trade industries that I work with um, are changing their perspective on what they have to do to build their next generation of workers. Um, so because you don't have a pipeline coming out of, of high school of kids that already know I want to be you know, in this field, um, they have to provide you know, an environment that trains these young people who may not have no experience, um, that engages them from the standpoint of their own uh, language, these two younger generations. Right. Uh, so understanding that young people uh, love it or hate it, live for the moment <laughs> right now. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right. So, and they want to um, be mobile. They want to be mobile. Yes. Yeah. yeah, right. The younger generations are really interesting. I've studied a lot of you know, millennials and Gen Zs and um, talk to a lot of them and kind of gotten a good perspective. I have a son who's 21 uh, who lives under my roof. So I see all of this. Um, 
And so it's a different approach to engaging with your workforce now than it used to be. Um, and uh, my trade industries, you know, I work very heavily with them to kind of educate them on how do you engage with these young people and how do you, um, once they're on the job, how do you continue to engage with them so that they're, you know, excited about their job, looking at this as a career versus just coming to work every day um, and willing to grow with the company. Right. And, you know, once upon a time, and maybe still in other cultures, we had apprenticeships. And that was a whole, um, that was a whole thing carried in from um, forever, from millennia in sure. different, in the different countries. So I'm not sure how that whole aspect. And so people who had come to this country and basically built this country from their other countries had yeah. had that in their wheelhouse. They had that knowledge base um, to, to do that whole internship thing. I mean, apprenticeship type of a thing. And how are you finding now? Um, is that still happening or now? The other segue to that question is seems like there are, and rightfully so, so many certifications. There's a lot of book learning that has to happen with so many of these trades. So how are you finding that context of kind of, again, passing the baton generationally um, or to the next Gen Z and now we have the younger ones even coming up now to, as you said, this is my calling. I really love what this is about. Um, all the while they get to grow their career into something else. So it, it's about kind of strategically putting all of this together. Right. Yeah. And yeah, as I said, the stars kind of have to align mm -hmm. in the three spaces, <laughs> yeah. education, the industry, yeah. and, and our younger people. Um, so the typical path for a young person, and, the, and this is a story that's not really being told in high schools, which is what we're working on is connecting the dots between What's, what the conversation is in high school and middle school and what what the need is in our trade businesses. Um, and so what's not happening in high school and middle school is a conversation about these are career opportunities. And so uh, a typical high school person, um, if they know anything about plumbing, is going to picture that as somebody going out and plunging your toilet uh, when you have a problem. But the, the reality of a career in plumbing is that you may be installing, for instance, uh, plumbing fixtures in a new home or doing piping or one of our plumbing companies actually did an ice rink and did all of the plumbing underneath the mm -hmm. ice. Um, so, so there's some really interesting um, opportunities in all of these career, uh, trade careers. Um, and also there's trade careers that these kids don't even know exist. Um, so that's kind of point number one. In terms of the certification, the training, the apprenticeships, all of the companies that I work with provide all of that. Mm -hmm. So the other conversation that's not having being had in high schools is that you can graduate and, and then on day one start as an apprentice in a program, um, working from the start, getting paid, so collecting a paycheck without any college debt. And mm -hmm. in many, many cases, these companies will pay for your training, whether it's on-the-job training or your certifications that you might need through uh, like uh, our local, let's say, Palm Beach State, who provides a lot of vocational programs, um, or a tech school, um, or a um, in the and a lot of the industries, they have industry groups that provide training, um, but typically our trade companies will pay for that. Um, so, you know, the story not being told to young people is, listen, if you're not destined for college and that's not something that you are interested in doing, take a look at all of these different career options where you can start right out of high school, start earning money right away, have no college debt and get trained on the job and have a career path that can take you anywhere because... You know, the beauty of uh, the trade industries is we all need plumbers and electricians. Doesn't matter where you live, right. <laughs> you can go anywhere. Yep. So yep. that's very appealing to young people who are typically not going to stay in a corporate setting for 20 years. They're typically going to work for a few years and then probably move to a, another part of the country or move to a, a different uh, area of interest. And that's just the reality of our young people today. But that's the story that we're trying to share with young people because it's not being shared with them right now. Well, I love this part because <clears throat> I've got a couple of different thoughts on that. One is um, you're absolutely right. And when my kids were coming up, my son is now, he's going to be, well, he's 31. And he is actually 
technically someone might call a trade type of an industry. He works as a rigger in theater. And that was, so his whole path um, and my daughter's path, who's now, she actually works for an online educational company. But the mantra as a parent was college, 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 college. And the best, 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 best one possible and all the testing, right? The relentless testing and the SAT scores. Now, as we know, college is amazing. And yet you're the part that was missing was the notion of, you know, if it's not your path, it's okay. Right. It's okay. And here are some other options. And that is, I appreciate that you're saying this. If this is now can be added to the um, the offices of the guidance counselors, especially right. in high school or even junior high school, to say not to not to pre-weed people out the kids because they're they're learning and growing every day. But especially by high school, at least to say, here are some options. Mm-hmm. Right. And this is what you're finding. And here in, in South Florida, and I did find that these do not, we are lucky here um, to have magnet programs and charter schools, mm-hmm. which really has broadened the spectrum of what kind of what is available to the kids. If it's music or art or theater um, and the trades and culinary, culinary is huge, hospitality, yes. sports, mm-hmm. management. These kids have uh, marine sciences. These kids have a huge um, spectrum of choices, which is amazing. And I did find, say in Massachusetts, they don't they don't have it. They don't mm-hmm. have not in the same way. Um, so that kind of brings it back to what you're saying is who can have the conversation with the kids and the families to say these are some other options for you instead of having the kid feeling I'm failing this test again, or I'll never get anywhere, or college isn't for me, all of those um, negative self-talk things. Yeah, and anybody who has a young person living in their home knows that you as a parent are Mm -hmm. the dumbest person on the face of the earth. (laughs) So (laughs) like, for me to have the conversation with my son about what he should do career-wise, um, and for for a parent of a high schooler to start telling them, well, you need to do this and you need to do that, it just doesn't resonate, you know, with young people. And and most of us were probably like that ourselves when we were in high school. So that's right. Um, so there needs to be a different conversation. So what we're doing at Take on Trades is each of the companies that um, works with us um, has to identify whether it's a Gen Zer or a millennial who currently works for them uh, Mm -hmm. in their company on the job. And basically we um, create video conversations with these young people um, about their path, how they got to where they got to, um, what their choices were and what they like and don't like about their jobs. Um, The important part um, because of the way that we're approaching this um, as talking to young people in schools, the conversation needs to be very authentic because young people are very adept um, they've been raised in a digital world. They understand if you're trying to sell them on something. That's right. They're very astute they, exactly. and they don't take any crap. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, so you need to have an authentic conversation peer to peer, meaning young people, yep. the young people yep. talking about, hey, this is what it's really like out here. So for instance, we have a kid who I call them kids. He's 30 uh, <laughs> who works in air conditioning here in South Florida. Uh, he came out of high school, did not want to go to college. He became a bartender. He was doing very well, making good money. But, you know, around 26, thought this isn't really a great career path for me. So he went into the HVAC business and he's doing very well and, and and he loves it. I have a young guy who's a plumber who thought he wanted to be a nurse, went to nursing school, didn't like it. Uh, and became a plumber and really enjoys what he does. So we have authentic young people local here um, who are telling their stories to local high schoolers here um, about what it's really like. And the idea is just to connect that conversation uh, so that young people in high schools can say, oh, yeah, this is authentic. This is, you know, and I'm going to listen to this person because they're in my uh, peer group. Um, and we have found that that conversation goes a lot more smoothly <laughs> than it may than may a conversation with a parent child or a, a guidance counselor child. It's just a more authentic approach to telling what it's really like to work in these trade uh, industries. That's very cool. And um, so again, with two two different questions, where I was going to go has to do with 
how far behind the scenes are these conversations? And I'm thinking of my friend Ray, who has been um, a senior editor with Scholastic Books. And so he's been in the edu um, elementary education field for his mm -hmm. 40 years. And so where I'm thinking about is how, where are the conversations and are there books in the children's libraries from a young age talking about being a plumber or talking about, hey, you know, this is what so-and-so does um, mm -hmm. to build in this factory or to bake a cake or all of these other um, ways that the adults can help be that bridge from the get-go of these are your options. Everything from nuclear science and rocket ships and STEM uh, jobs into these are the hands-on, these are, you're a gardener or a farmer. Or, or is that part of what you're seeing from how young of an age um, within the school systems, perhaps? Yeah, so it's been interesting working within the school system because, you know. Are they receptive? Like, I think in the, that those are yeah. the, that's my ultimate question. Are the school systems receptive to this conversation? I will say, yes, they are. Um, but. <laughs> <laughs> However. <laughs> Um, you know, I come from private industry. I ran my own company for 21 years. You you can do a lot. You know, you you say, hey, we need to go up this hill. We're going to go up this hill. And there's not a lot of barriers except, you know, maybe money and time. Mm -hmm. In the education system, you know, there's a lot of um, check boxes that you have to check and a lot of paperwork you have to go through and a lot of approvals. And, you know, right now I'm kind of working my way through that uh, with our local school system here in Palm Beach County. And, you know, everybody has been super receptive to what we're doing and has been um, very uh, positive about wanting to bring what we're doing into schools. Um, but uh, we have to go through the conduits that, you know, the school district has or, or individual schools have. And what I've found most challenging and most interesting, and I don't know if this is typical of Palm Beach County or um, across the nation, but um, each school kind of works independently. Um, so to have a conversation throughout all high schools um, is not possible that I know of. <laughs> Maybe somebody in the school. So we are today. <laughs> we get more people <laughs> yes. listening. Yeah, we have a broad, um, broad in the conversation. Yeah. Right. So there's just no conduit to like work your way through all the schools. So, uh, you know, yeah. kind of talking to individuals who I know are in spaces where they're trying to help kids who are not college bound um, and trying to bring into schools an educational piece to, um, you know, here's a path. Um, what's really interesting about the trades is that all of these kids could actually talk to the owners of companies who largely did not go to college, came out, some of them don't even have high school degrees or have a GED, yep. um, and built their own companies and were very successful with it. Yep. And I, that's, that's a very important part, um, mm -hmm. topic, and I'm glad you brought that up, is that that is absolutely true, that, again, you know, college degrees are fantastic. Mm -hmm. But not everybody who is wildly successful has a college degree. And I don't think that's really voiced as loudly as it could. Again, let's cheerlead all of the kids, especially if they're feeling I'm not worthy or my future is not right unless I'm at that A level and pass these SATs and these things that are not meant for everybody to pass. Here are some real success stories and you can still do it. You can fly. Yeah, and you have to, and as you touched on earlier, you kind of have to overcome the conversation that we parents have had for many years with our children about going right. to college and how that's the best path in terms of making good income and having good jobs. Mm -hmm. um, so we kind of shot ourselves in the foot when we did that because, <laughs> uh, because you really can do, I mean, I have um, uh, business owners who, as I said, uh, graduated from high school, maybe do not have college degrees, but have, you know, multiple homes, they have vacation homes, they have boats, they have very nice cars, you oh. know, they have RVs. So, you know, the story that these young people can build a career and live a lifestyle um, without having a college degree by pursuing a career in trades is very real. Um, and to be able to meet these entrepreneurs, these people who just started these companies and um, and built themselves into very successful companies and very successful business owners. Well, and I think that going back to the, the you know good old mom and dad, there's it is a fear factor. 
well, if my kid doesn't go to school, they're going to be a couch potato forever. So what, what is happening is that that's, that's not necessarily true either. And maybe some kids are meant to be a couch potato, who knows? But point being is that to be in these industries or to have, um, there's still structure, right? And there's still a reason to get up every day and yeah. to find what lights somebody up, male, female, whoever, whatever their age is, what lights you up and then go and do that. Mm-hmm. But it, and that and then if you find that that morphs into something else cool if you find that that you're meant to have your own business even better yeah. so these are all these are really amazing stepping stones and that mom and dad give yourself a break your kid is not going <laughs> to be a couch potato forever maybe they're a little <laughs> bit of a potato because they're they're so overwhelmed with these messages of, sure. of too much it's just it becomes overwhelming sometimes Well, I think it's, I often tell my son, like, I would not want to be a kid these days. Um, You know, there's so many things that they're facing that we never faced. And the distractions. Um, Yes. Yeah. And, um, you know, you bring up these kind of magnet programs that are in schools, which actually start very young. Um, So in middle school, you're putting your kid in a pre-med program and who knows? Who knows, (laughs) right? I want to be a doctor. Right. Um, So I think we try to like, lay out these career paths when, in my opinion, what we should be doing is exposing our our young people to a lot of different career paths and helping them decide like what is right for them and what is not. Um, And recognizing that, you know, a lot of us have picked career paths that then have changed over time. And, you know, you're not tied to being in this career. You can always take a look later on and 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 make a career choice and move to something else. So right. uh, you know when my son my son graduated high school during COVID, he went to college for a year. He hated it. He came home and I said, well, you either work or you go to school. <laughs> so <laughs> right. Again, with the structure of something, right? The structure of something for sure. Right. And so I sent him out with a number of my different trade owners, different careers. And he was up on a condo on Palm Beach, 12-story condo, installing a new AC unit. And he said, this is not for me, but it's really cool. Um, He went to work for a company that does, um, you know, IT support and, and replaces phone screens and uh, that, and that didn't work out. And then eventually he went to work for uh, another trade company that I work with that does high-end window treatments and upholstery. And he was in, you know, the Ritz Carlton installing draperies and things. Um, and, you know, after a year he said, you know, I think I'm going to go back to school, but that was his choice. Um, he had been exposed to different careers and, um, and now he's kind of more focused on what he wants to do. Well, the, but every Every little thing every day is a is a stepping stone and a learning experience. So that's really fantastic. Um, you know, the other one more piece to to tap into is, and especially the show is international um, and throughout the whole United States. Thinking again about um, the, I guess people come from all many countries, and we have the different visas for different industries that they have to. As hospitality is huge. They don't have the people here, um, so they are recruiting people from other countries to come in to the United States. How might you be able to help be one of these bridges, all pun intended, we need bridge builders and, and, and street builders and all that, be that kind of conduit? What would you say to the national and international audience of business owners and people listening that might want to come and and um, reboot their own careers and and launch something fresh. Yeah, I think the conversation is, you know, I, I don't like to get into the politics of immigration. No, not, <laughs> yeah. we don't, and we don't um, even have to. This is this is really a personal, it's such a personal journey. Sure. And that you are a connector from, as you said, connecting the dots. You are connecting people to what they might be feeling in, in their heart and soul or wondering about for themselves and how to make that bridge so for a better life. Yeah, I think I, what I people it. need to realize is that this is a a huge issue. Yeah. Um, 89% of contractors report that they can't find labor. So right. that's the majority of contractors in the US. Um, and how that translates to you and me is that uh, 
in project delays. So Huge. if you put a deposit on a condominium that you want to live on the beach, you know, chances are, and you hear this conversation all the time, well, they're telling me nine months, but it's really going to be really years. a lot longer and, <laughs> and three times more expensive. And, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So it affects all of us. Um, so we would need to recognize that, you know, the conduit to um, whether they're young people in high schools or they're people coming from other countries, um, there needs to be a conduit to getting these people into these industries. Um, and the, a little bit of the hurdle is talking to the uh, the owners of these companies because, you know, they're my age. I don't mind saying I'm 56 years old. Like I got to be 60. It's awesome. <laughs> right. It's fantastic. <laughs> these people are my age. They're in their yeah. 60s. They're possibly in their 70s. Yeah. And, you know, they've been running a business a certain way for a long time. And I get that because I was a business owner. However, you know, in order to build this conduit, you're going to have to change. Like you're going to have to take a look at how you better engage with young people, how you better engage them on the job, how you keep your workers happy. Um, and keep them coming back and and adding more. And then in terms of, you know, the immigration piece, like what is the conduit? Because we're not going to solve this problem 100% by opening the conversation between young people in U.S. high schools and and, and that uh, pathway. Right. Uh, we need to solve the problem in, in a broader spectrum. And, um, you know, I'm not quite tackling that. Yet. Right. <laughs> I get it. I get it. But when I show people the numbers of, you know, I think it's 440,000 trade workers are needed next year. Uh, you know, wow. they're just enormous. And, you know, there's there's no conduit or very little conduit right now for how we're going to fulfill those jobs. Well, it sounds like nothing but huge opportunity and in the best way. You know, you fulfill somebody else's uh, career path, which then fulfills these things that need to happen. And, and that's a win-win. I'm all about the win-win all around for everybody. Um, so do you have I know, that one more little topic that we're going to be talking about, but on your take on trades company um, is what else would you like people to know about that or how to contact you about this? Yes, yeah, so we have a website. It's takeontrades.com. Um, has a lot of the information that I shared in terms of the statistics of what's going on. Gives you a history of that if you're interested. Um, and a lot of videos on, you know, what's happening in the trades and what the response has been. And then, uh, you know, I'm always looking for companies who want to recruit and want to recruit in a new new world um, and want to try to connect the dots with young people and and, and those in the schools. And, you know, uh, anybody in education would be a wonderful connection for me uh, to help me navigate that as well. That That's huge. And I loved what you said earlier and what you're saying now, too, about this is we have the wisdom, those of us in a certain age, and if we've run our businesses or done things in a certain way. Now we have the next generation who wants to also impart their wisdom because they're here to teach us as well. And so how to have those conversations. And you mentioned something about that is that how do you speak their language, how each other's language, how do you speak that language? Exactly. So I really appreciate that. And, and, um, yeah, reach, reach out to Valerie for this. Now though, one more thing that you and I will have an entirely separate show about, but I did want to make mention that you also have a nonprofit and you're author of a beautiful book. So tell us about that before we sign off here and that will lead us into another show. Sure. Um, so most, uh, well, I shouldn't say most, a lot of nonprofit work, a lot of charitable work comes from a personal experience. Uh, my personal experience was um, I lost my husband um, in 2009. He died suddenly. Um, and he left me a widow at 42. My son was seven. Uh, so I personally experienced this grief journey um, and found it very challenging, as most people do. Um, and particularly as a mother raising a son in grief. Um, so shortly, a few years after my husband died, I started a charity called Pandora's Kids uh, to help children in grief um, and uh, connect the dots between how we support uh, young people who are grieving and their and their parents as well or their caretakers. Um, so I've been working that for gosh about ten years now, um, and uh, it's been a very interesting journey. And I also wrote a book about the year after the death of my husband. Um, it's called This Side of Heaven and uh, just kind of tells the story of what it's like in the year following the death of, of a spouse um, and trying to raise a child during that grief period. 
wow, beautiful and harrowing and beautiful and mm-hmm. all, all of the adjectives. That's really great. And um, Pandora's, what's it called? Pandora's, Pandora's kids. Pandora's kids. That yeah. we, again, you and I will have a whole separate show about this because this is wonderful. I appreciate it. It's beautiful. And um, I'm thinking of some kiddos who are grandkids of their pappy, their poppy who just passed away. And sure. so, you know, the ripple effects and um, how to, again, it's all about conversation and how to speak to the young people and, and their adult caregivers along the way, along these, all these journeys. Yes, absolutely. So Absolutely. So we'll have you back again, Valerie. I appreciate uh, so it. So thank you so much for being here. And do you actually, we might as well put the plug for that. Where do we find the nonprofit if somebody wants to tap in before we have our show? Yeah, pandoraskids.org is the website. Um, a lot of good information, a lot of good resources um, if you're going through a grief experience um, and a lot of help for families and children. Perfect, beautiful. Valerie, thank you again. Thank you, Heather. I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. And thanks everybody for listening. Please be sure to like, review, follow, and share this podcast. And if you want to be part of the conversation, which this one is extraordinary, please let's talk about this very these very topics. Um, please send emails to podcasts at lastingconversations.com and follow us on Facebook at Lasting Conversations. This is Lasting Conversations. We get to the heart of everything.